Thanks, Trevor. And uh, I'm delighted to be participating in this along with Said Park and Kona and Trevor. You know, it's an exciting event and trying to merge a lot of different ideas and concepts. And um, so, you know, a lot of the stuff you may be aware of different aspects of it, but it's to my role, I suppose, this morning in the workshop is sort of to set the foundation for the for the road ahead and for what's to follow and to explore some aspects of sustainability. I suppose you can't cover such a broad area of sustainability in you know 20 or 30 minutes, but just to explore it from a few different perspectives that would hopefully hopefully set the context for what's to follow. So this event is part of a radical sustainability lab that came from the Centre for Sustainability, which looks at sort of innovative approaches um, to teaching and learning practice, but also industry and community engagement. And we're delighted to have Park and Corona participating um, in this, who are you know a core part of that, looking at design thinking and having a workshop where people can interact with it in the second half seems like a really exciting opportunity for people. So I'm going to go through quite quickly a number of different issues around sustainability. Um, but first, though, I'd like because it's such a broad concept and it's open to so many different interpretations, I'd like people to sort of take uh, a minute or two to post what they think sustainability is in, in the Q&A or in the chat, whichever is available to you. So, you know, three words that you would use to describe sustainability just to start off the process would be, you know, great to get your perspectives on what you think sustainability is. And just to highlight that there's no wrong answer here. It's just to get your interpretation because that will set the context from as we go forward. So I might give you a 60 seconds just to pop a couple of uh, words in the chat or the Q&A. Yeah, so a couple that are in there, triple bottom line, very good, Connor. Climate, carbon, recycling. All of these are, are very relevant, as Trevor mentioned. You know, we're looking at the environmental, economic and social side of things. Waste management, uh, strong succession. Use what we got already and very important. And so a team I'll be talking about this morning is the, the circular economy. Reduce and repurpose. Yeah, very good. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll continue on, but some of those we'll, we'll utilize some of those actually for the workshop later on, some of the definitions. So keep posting in the Q&A in the chat. <clears throat> some, so when we look at the broad definitions of sustainability, you'll see two definitions there on your screen. And I suppose the Brooklyn definition continues to be used but it's a very human centric in its interpretation as it has a, you know, a clear bias that is very much focused on us, which is to be expected, I suppose, since we, we developed the definition. Um, but we see now the definitions are beginning to evolve. And if you take the one from the US Environmental Protection Agency, there's a recognition there of our place in the overall scheme of things and how we have to respect our environment and look to live in harmony with nature and other species as we rely on each other. So when I'm looking at the why, rather what I'm going to focus on is some policy and legislation rather than listing a lot of negative effects that we are having on the environment from biodiversity loss to resource consumption to waste. And these are things that you can see in the media and the news quite a lot. So what I'm going to look at is the legislation and policy side for a couple of slides. So as many of you be aware, the EU Green Deal is a very ambitious plan to move towards a decarbonized society. It encompasses a whole suite of measures from clean energy, sustainable transport, national capital and the protection of biodiversity, zero pollution, food, agriculture, a just transition and also a circular economy. From an Irish perspective, we have the Climate Action Plan and the Climate Action Mandate, which outlines a number of sort of targets uh, for us as a society to try and achieve. We have the whole of government circular economy strategy from 2022 to 2023. And just to note that the circular hotspots, which is an international event, has been hosted in Dublin this year and is actually on this week in Dublin. So I'll post a link to that. Some of you may be interested in that. Some really exciting things happening there. And we also have a development plan, implementation plan for the sustainable development goals. And there on the bottom right, I just want to highlight a sort of key publication from, from us, uh, from a higher education perspective, but generally from an education across all levels and also from a societal point of view is the Education for Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Development Strategy to 2030. And the reason why that's so important is if we look at higher education specifically, 
there's 245,000 students in, in higher education. So that's a phenomenal resource. And if you add in the 20 to 25,000 staff on top of that, you know, we have a quarter of a million people who are engaged in a system or in a structure that could be utilized um, from a sustainability or climate action point of view. So we have a lot of really good work going on across higher education, but we haven't that sort of holistic collaborative approach yet um, to you know create that sort of one vision across higher education to support um, the climate action transition and to embrace the challenges that are involved in it. So it's something uh, to think about when you put it down as an actual number um, on screen. So again, just to get some insight into sort of attitudes and awareness, because I think this is uh, really important because it sets the scenes because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence around this, but this is actually some surveys and studies and research projects that have been carried out. So from a European perspective, um, a survey was carried out in 2021 and there's a real awareness of the seriousness of climate change, as you can see there on your screen. Some interesting findings are that almost all Europeans have taken some environmentally friendly action although that they don't believe they bear the main responsibility for tackling climate change. Six and 10 Europeans believe that within the EU, national governments are respons responsible for taking climate change, tackling climate change ahead of business industry. And also it's close to three quarters of European believe that the costs of damage caused by climate change are much higher than the cost of the investment needed for a green transition. So some really interesting findings there, um, putting a lot of onus on the governments to act so from an Irish perspective, in 2021, the EPA embarked on a new project with Yale University Program on Climate Change Communications to research the attitudes, behaviours, policy preferences and beliefs of the Irish public to climate change. And this was published in a really excellent report called Climate Change in the Irish Mind. And if we look at some of the results of that, um, it says that most Irish people say they know at least a moderate amount um, about climate change. And there's almost complete agreement up to 96% that climate change is happening. But interestingly, uh, most people think climate change is caused at least in part by human activities, so 60%, and say that it's mostly caused human caused, and 33% say it's caused equally by both human activities and natural changes. A large majority, up to 85%, are worried about climate change, and 37% uh, described themselves as very worried. And so we see this whole um, a concept of climate anxiety and so on, especially in our younger generation, which is a, a, a cause for concern. There's high levels of engagement around climate change. 91% of people say climate change is important to them personally, and 72% report that they often uh, discuss this or occasionally discuss climate change with family and friends. And again, interesting when we look at responsibility on the right hand side there, 90 percent of people say the country has a responsibility to act on climate change and should do what it can to reduce its own greenhouse gas emissions. And most people also say that they're willing to take political action to reduce climate change and are willing to participate in the campaign to convince elected officials to act. So, you know, a lot of really interesting findings there from that survey that sort of set the context. In summary, there's sort of the summary ones. And so when we look at some of the actions, you know, consumer activism, you know, the selection of um, more environmentally friendly or organic sort of projects, if affordable, and the concept of diet changes as well was also mentioned. So again, I'll put a link to that report in the chat after my own presentation, but some really interesting findings there that are very good references when you're looking at sort of um, how to set the context around climate action and sustainability. So, of course, we're also in a sort of a time where, you know, a lot of our younger generation participated in climate strikes and internationally, but also in Ireland. And the, the thing to think about there is that these younger generations are now becoming of an age where they can vote. They're also entering higher education, further education. They're also into, entering into employment. So there is a lot of research done from an educational perspective that there is an expectation that sustainability and climate action is embedded within uh, these systems. And uh, you know, that is an interesting sort of dynamic that's happening as well. And I suppose a lot of the younger generation, again, led by, you know, Greta can sort of see through the rhetoric. And, you know, there's some interesting, um, been some interesting activity around the COPs um, activities each year. But, you know, they're pretending to take our future seriously, um, but still looking at talking about money and fairy tales of continuous economic growth and, find, you know, infinite resources and so on. Um, you know, sometimes you need to be told, um, you know, straight to your face what what 
their perception is of things because they are the people who are inheriting the sort of damage that's been done. So those, those sort of statements and quotes are very powerful messages and should be taken sort of seriously um, to get away from the rhetoric and to move towards action. And what's interesting is, you know, you, you read a lot about the scale of transformation that's needed for renewable energies and a you know, circular economy and all it is. But fundamentally, what we're talking about here is a transformation in thinking. And that sort of will lead on to design thinking with Corona and Park later on in their presentation and the workshop. But it's a fundamental sort of reimagining of the way we think, which is a really difficult concept um, to grasp. And I, I, we have a colleague here in ATU, Dr. Mark Garvan, who sort of has a very unique sort of perception of this, where he believes we need to revisit the 22nd of June, 1633, when Galileo was put on trial by the Inquisition in Rome. So Galileo at the time had to renounce with sincere heart and unfeigned faith that his belief that the sun and not the earth was the center of the universe and that the earth moved around the sun and not vice versa as uh, church teaching dictated at the time. And what's really interesting about it is like most people know this, won't know this uh, story or what happened, but it wasn't until 1992, some 353 years later, that the Vatican finally agreed that Galileo was right. Uh, you know, so hopefully when we're talking about climate action, that it won't take so long for the sort of penny to drop. But the premise is fundamentally the same, that it, it's, we are not the centre of the universe or even the centre of the earth. The earth will manage quite well without us and maybe even thrive after we're gone. So there is a need to live in harmony and with humility, which seems to be a difficult concept for people to understand. And we're, you know, we're allegedly a very advanced species, and yet we find this difficulty to think about living in harmony and living with humility uh, with your environment. So it's sort of something to think about. So some images sort of to prompt some of these sort of thinking. And, and you know, often I show this, especially to students, and I ask the question, I said, well, well, what do you see here? And the most common answer I get is, um, you know, I see a deer crossing a road and I think, well, why is the deer stopped in the middle of the road or why is it crossing the road? You know, a car or truck can come around the corner and, you know, might kill the deer or might, might cause damage to the truck. Or alternatively, you could see, do I see a road consisting of aggregates, concrete, tarmac positioned in the middle of a deer's habitat? And the question is, who is the intruder here in this picture? And again, that's sort of re recalibrating your sort of view of the image. So images can be really powerful when you're looking at different perspectives around sustainability. Similarly, and this is, you know, very topical at the moment, obviously, with our housing crisis and our homelessness crisis and, you know, continuing inequalities, social inequalities. But again, you know, an image is show, shown here and, you know, the first impression, well, I see three derelict properties there that should be demolished. But what I see there is three examples of material banks. And I think about the amount of human and material resources that went into the planning, designing, constructing and operating these buildings. Uh, and I'm not even uh, discussing the sort of social act, uh, aspect of it, you know, the, the stories that people living in it and so on. Because of this, because the most sustainable building is the one that's not actually built, it would seem obvious that we should reuse these buildings if they're not gone beyond reuse. And if they are gone beyond reuse, that we should deconstruct them and disassemble them and reuse and recycle the components and materials within them. So, you know, we have a clear responsibility and, you know, if you split responsibility, you know, it's the ability to respond. But the difficulty is, I suppose, that the sustainability rhetoric and, you know, you can call it greenwashing is very strong, you know, and well expressed across all sectors. Um, but it still be, it supports the dominant models of unfettered economic growth, unlimited resource ability and humanity's perceived hierarchical relationship with nature and other species. So again, we need to explore how can we um, sort of rebalance this and how can we uh, encourage thinking that would look at this in a more holistic way. So what I want to do is look through a couple of examples of a recently released EU Green Competency Framework, which encom encompasses things like embodying values, embracing complexity, envisioning futures and acting for sustainability. So the Green Competency Framework was released last year by the EU, and it's the idea is to foster and nurture a sustainability mindset by looking to develop knowledge, skills, attitudes, and think, plan, and act with empathy. So that aligns with your design thinking approach, responsibility, and care for our planet. And when we look at the different 
um, competencies that are outlined, you know, it's it's very thorough and it's also very holistic. So the idea of values being one of the most important thing. And, you know, when you think about your sort of your, your life in your work life or your academic life or whatever, wherever you're coming from, you know, where does value sit? You know, where does value sit within an organization? Where do values sit within a university? Can you tell me what the values are of X, Y, and Z university or organization and that they are genuine? Um, the second one about complexity is not to be sort of afraid of complexity. You know, sustainability is a complex issue. Climate change is a complex issue. You know, there's no sort of black and white answers to this. And our society has moved towards very much this sort of yes or no and disagreement sort of status. So the complexity needs interdisciplinarity, it needs transdisciplinarity, it needs different sectors coming together like digitalization, sustainability, design thinking, it needs all of these to come into the mix and work together in a sort of collaborative and open and transparent way. The third one looking at futures is really interesting because what you're trying to do there is the capacity and capability to sort of look into the future and then to work back from the future. So if you know you sort of have a number of multiple futures and possibilities of way the future could be as a society and as an economy and what needs to be done to reach that goal. So that skill and that ability is really important as well. And the final one is the actual action. So, you know, there can be a lot of talking about sustainability. There can be a lot of sort of rhetoric around it. But what is actual, you know, how do you act? So how do you engage with the political system? How do you come together as a collective? And there's a huge number of examples of sort of collectives of communities coming together um, from a sustainability point of view, but also from a social point of view. And then what can you do as an individual? And if we look at the education for sustainable development goals and their learning objectives, you know, there's quite there's a lot of similarities between them, which are systems thinking, future thinking, critical thinking, which we'd all be aware of. But down here at the bottom, you know, the self-awareness competency, looking at your own values and perceptions and actions and where they've come from. Uh, look at abnormal com competencies, you know, how society influences. We have very narrow sort of categories in society, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So the ability to embrace different cultures, to embrace different viewpoints, all of these things are really, really important from a sustainability point of view. So just a couple of examples, because as I said, you know, it's such a broad um, concept that I wanted to pick a couple of examples that people may have heard of. So a lot of people may have heard of the, the concept of the circular economy. And I suppose if you're looking at the circular economy, what you're looking at is, you know, the key principles and, and the key principles are there. You know, it's, it's actually preventing waste before it happens, minimizing the amount of resources you need, keeping materials and things in their loop so that they're not being disposed of and then sort of regenerating natural systems and complementing natural systems where possible. And the two key concepts of this is, you know, value and utility. So a circular economy favors activities that preserve value in the form of energy, labor and materials. This means looking at designing for durability, reuse, remanufacturing and recycling to keep these products components in a continuous loop within the economy. And also when you look at utility and the example that's on your screen there, you know, the use of the of the welly as a flower bed, that's actually demonstrating a lower utility, but it's still placing a value on the product to reuse it. So we mentioned recycling in a sustainability context. More often than not, that is actually downcycling. So the material doesn't retain its utility and value, but it's been downcycled, but it's preventing it to, you know, from being disposed. So it's still a benefit, but it's at the lower end of the hierarchy. So, you know, very simply, when you're in a circular economy system, you know, the things that I mentioned there, the idea of sharing products, using them for longer, reusing and repairing things, we recycle them and throwing them away. And there is moves from a legislative point of view in the European Union to push towards this. And again, when you look at a lot of the community um, initiatives, a lot of people are embracing these concepts and have embraced these concepts for many number of years. So the take, make, you know, waste system, the linear system is, is there, it's ripe for disruption at the moment. And there is a lot of disruption going on. A couple of examples of this is, you know, the Jared Street with the subscription service with their headphones, that it's the, uh, manufactured in a modular way so they can be reused. It's also a subscription so they can return them at the at their end of function or end of life or whatever, uh, so that can, they can be kept in the loop. 
We also have, and you know, some of you may be aware of these in your own communities, the Toronto Tool Library, a makerspace where you sort of have the sharing of tools within the community. But what happened in Toronto is these became sort of innovation hubs where they brought makers together and, and sort of burgeoned into something completely different from what it was originally uh, intended. A couple of examples of, you know, retail and stores, a store in Berlin, which has, you know, upcycled furniture and recycled and reused products. And then upstairs, it has this sort of meeting space, communication space to talk about all these different systems. One I particularly like is a supermarket in, in Cologne, which sells products, you know, salvage food waste opened in, in, in Germany, in Cologne. And what's really interesting about this is that there's no fixed prices. So it's like an honesty box exploded up into a supermarket sort of realm. Uh, and what you can see there is, you know, a lot of it is down to the presentation, a very nice presentation. And, you know, people are utilizing this. Uh, all this food would have ended up on waste somewhere, which is essentially a sin. So, you know, it's been reused in, or been sold here as a, a genuine product and people pay what they think it's worth. So just a couple of slides on the digital side of things. So if they, if from a European Union perspective, they're looking at digitalization as a twin transition with sustainability. And so there is sort of a sweet spot where digitalization can complement and support sustainability in, initiatives. Um, but the key thing about digitalization is essentially it's information. And what you want to do is utilize that information for, for good if you can. So there's a, a number of different examples where essentially if you have the information about products, components, buildings and so on, that you can leverage this to make sure that they aren't ending up as waste and that they can be continued to use within their um, value chain. Here's a couple of examples, you know, with plastic recyclers not aware of the chemical makeup and the toxicity of products, um, repair technicians not having assembly or access to disassembly guidelines, if there are disassembly guidelines. Um, another interesting example is the Mars line has developed a cradle to cradle passport for their ships um, so that they identify what has gone into the ships. So when they're looking at sort of repair and maintenance, they would have a sort of footprint of it. But also if it's coming to its end of life, that it can be disassembled and recycled and disposed of properly or actually reused in some cases as well. When you scale this up to sort of buildings and, and uh, built environment infrastructure, the idea of building passports and digital twins can help retain, adapt and upgrade buildings, can help design out waste and conserve resources. It's all about material selection, functional flexibility, the performance of the building over its lifetime, and also having maybe components of a building as a product, as a service. So what that means is you may not own the, say, cladding of your building, but you may be renting it. Same for carpets, you may not own the carpet, but you are renting it. And there's a lot of advantages there. Lighting is another one which has um, um, been demonstrated in the Netherlands. And this all helps with the disassembly part of a building so that the components aren't going to waste, that they're being reused for new buildings and so on. And for that to work well, you need a sort of long term view, because obviously the built environment is built for, from a from a long term perspective. So you need to think, you know, maybe 80, 100 years ahead of time, um, which can be a difficult concept to grasp um, when you're you know, living in the present and all the pressures of the present. So again, I put a couple of other examples up there for people when you're looking at digital marketplaces. So there's a lot of digital marketplaces out there that look at trading of secondary raw materials and so on and having suppliers and buyers to find each other and you can have it from food, plastics, construction materials, metals and so on. You'll see them uh, listed there. But obviously we have to be conscious of the environmental and social pressures related to the digital transformation. So it's not the, you know, the, the the perfect solution, you know, with the hardware, there is uh, issues around resource depletion, water consumption, social inequity, land use and land use change, biodiversity. You know, when you're looking at systematic change, you might have unintended consequences and you have to ask yourself, you know, do the benefits of this engagement outweigh the, the potential negative impacts? And I suppose what, what I'd like to finish off with then is a couple of slides on the idea of if you look at the circular economy, which has gained a lot of traction across Europe, say, since 2015, when they brought out the circular economy strategy, that grew out of a whole host of different concepts from uh, industrial ecology, industrial symbiosis, um, biomimicry, uh, biophilia, uh, regenerative design, and it also emerged together into circular economy principle, which is now, you know, 
they have a circular economy policy, we have a circular economy legislation. Um, so all these ideas usually merge out of other ideas that maybe weren't sort of jumped on at the time, but they all sort of merge in to sort of create these ideas. So that's something to, to think about. And I suppose, you know, when we're talking to different, whether engaging with communities or industry or, or with our students, what we're looking at is when you're looking at this sort of problem solving and embracing complexity is sometimes there's a couple of steps, you know, embrace the obvious. Sometimes you don't see what's obviously there in front of us um, as an option. Um, learn from others is a key thing and be open to that learning and to be sharing of knowledge and ideas. Explore the less obvious, so that's where your creativity and imagination can flow. Um, have fun about it and be optimistic about it. It's very hard to be creative when, when you're not optimistic about things. Um, be visionary, see how it can scale up and don't be afraid to be visionary. Uh, and to have this debate and reflection about different ideas and how that may work. And also to be pragmatic, to bring it back to how this actually work in, in society and in your organization and in you know, uh, universities. So just to finish off, you know, a quote um, from a very famous quote from Margaret Mead, you know, never doubt what a small group of thoughtful citizens can do to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing they ever has. And this is a thing um, that we sort of stress to students, particularly like, and especially if they're working in sort of groups that, you know, to have that ambition for yourselves and for us to have their that ambition for them as well, that they can come up with really good ideas and that they can you know, not necessarily solve, but go along the way to helping to sort of transition to a decarbonized and, you know, more, um, it, equitable society. So that's me, I think. Um, hopefully I'm on time. Thanks very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentations. Mm -hmm.